everyone and welcome to No BS Baking, got JP here. Now today we're going to talk about salt. One of the most essential minerals on earth has been cherished by civilizations for thousands of years as a flavor enhancer and food preservative. It's also been the cornerstone in the art of baking since ancient times. So without further ado, let's get into it. Salt has played a crucial role in human history dating back to ancient civilizations. In Mesopotamia around 3000 BCE, salt extraction was already well-established practice and used primarily for food preservation. Salt became a valuable trading commodity whereby salt trade routes were established, like the one of the most famous ones which ran from Morocco across the Sahara to Timbuktu. Civilizations collected salt from natural sources like seawater, salt flats, and mines with similar collection and processing techniques still practiced in many parts of the world. In baking, salt is a fundamental ingredient. It enhances flavors, controls fermentation, and strengthens gluten structure, contributing to the texture and taste of baked goods. Stating the obvious, salt contributes to the flavor of bread, balancing sweetness if sugars are used, and enhances the flavors of other ingredients that you may have in your recipe. Salt controls the rate of fermentation, providing a controlled rise for the baker, whereby with yeast adjustments they can make predictable baking plans for whatever product style or characteristics they're looking for, versus an uncontrollable explosion of yeast activity. Sodium reacts with glue, providing a strengthening effect, creating a tighter, firmer, and bounce-back elastic properties that form a cohesive web capable of trapping and holding gas in the dough for good, strong rise potential. Bread without salt could go usually in two ways. It can be dense and compact due to poor, insufficient rise, or in the case where the bread has risen well without collapse, it can exhibit a more open, less uniform crumb structure. Salt indirectly contributes to the crust color by controlling yeast activity, which directly affects the available sugars during the baking process. Besides well-known strengthening, conditioning, and fermentation control benefits that sodium provides baked goods, without salt, foods would be a lot more boring. Bread would be bland, cakes would lack depth, the pastries wouldn't have the perfect balance of flavors, and don't even get me going on the other areas of the culinary spectrum. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the differences between these, but let's just say that from a pure sodium perspective, one is not healthier than the other, and they both perform identical. Now, some bakers and chefs, when asked which they prefer, they will either shrug their shoulders with indifference or lean towards non-iodized. Some chefs say that certain dishes iodized salt can give a bit of a metallic aftertaste, opting for brands and salt types which do not contain iodine, such as Sea salt, Himalayan pink salt, and kosher salt, all of these pr are produced with varying grind sizes for both cooking and baking applications. Fine grind sea salt, fine kosher, or regular table salt are generally the most common salts used in bread baking. However, all are sodium chloride and all perform similarly with respect to the reactions that occur in the dough and overall baking performance. Sea salt is classified as a salt derived directly from the ocean or sea through the evaporation of seawater. Sea salt is most, mostly sodium chloride but contains a number of trace minerals which can contribute slightly different flavors and colors. Himalayan pink salt is actually a bit misleading as it's actually classified as a rock salt or halite. However, it evaporated from the seawater like some 600 million years ago. Like sea salt, it can contain many trace elements up to 10% that are considered healthy minerals. However, it mostly is sodium chloride, so the same sodium intake warnings generally hold true. Kosher salt is basically pure sodium chloride that does not contain any iodine or anti-caking additives. Its clean flavor profile makes it a common choice for chefs and bakers alike. Besides the sea and mines, the salt is also collected and produced and harvested from salt flats and of course salt lakes. All of these sources of salt are mainly sodium chloride. Then you have some of the designer or boutique salts produced around the world. Some occur naturally, while others are infused or mixed with additives to impart flavor, color, or perceived nutritional benefit, 
or to add a level of trendiness to a range of food and bakery items you want to produce. Once again, all of these are mainly sodium chloride, and so in theory, they all technically work perfectly in bakery items. However, the color and flavor they impart may not work with the product you want to make. Standard salt level of 2% is used as, and recommended as a start point for new recipes for the following reasons. It optimizes dough strength without being overpowering in flavor, acts as a base control for yeast activity so you can achieve the fermentation time you want based on the consistency of your dough and the environmental conditions. Likewise, yeast is generally used based on a standard as noted, then adjusted on later bakes for optimizing the points I just stated. Maybe you have a one-hour rest and proof time plan or overnight refrigerated bulk fermentation. Everything starts from a base salt standard. The amount of water or hydration you plan your dough is important. The softer the dough, the quicker it will rise. The stiffer or less water, the slower it will rise. Salt remains the base control component and yeast is adjusted to accommodate the hydration and environmental variables. We'll get into this in another module. However, mix times are directly linked to the level of salt you plan in your dough. And as important as the above, final dough temperature after mixing is directly intertwined for assuring both fermentation time balance and a nice controlled and strong rise in your product, where it does not age too quickly, especially during the first rising steps. Final dough temperature is critical in properly balancing your recipe. I'm showing this only as a quick reference for working with recipes that may not follow standards. You can stop the video here and review it. Where I'm going with this is recipes that have below 1.5% salt, you need to be careful with on your first go around. This is especially true when the salt amounts are below 1.25%. At this level or below, they may work or they en may end up in complete disaster. Always start with standards. Feel it out, then decrease to suit your to your taste or sodium objectives in the next bake. Well, there is no real substitute for sodium chloride in bread making as a one-to-one -one replacer, but you can reduce sodium in your bread recipe significantly without dramatically affecting the baking performance. Potassium chloride, as an example, can be used to replace 25% of the sodium in your recipe with no change to the baking performance or flavor. When used up to 50%, Sensory taste test panels concluded that they could note some metallic aftertaste. However, it was deemed minimal falling into an acceptable range. Potassium chloride is used in many sodium-reduced products to not only take out the sodium, but to substitute potassium, which is often lacking in most adult diets. Calcium chloride is another option working its way into sodium-reduced products and adding that beneficial calcium to the diet. Its flavor profile differs slightly from sodium chloride, necessitating cautious use. Do your research. Due to the variance in granule size of salt and just the generally poor accuracy of volumetric measures, always weigh salt. Salt in yeast raised doughs can range between 0% and as high as 2.5%. Common range is between 1.5 and 2.25%, with 2% being the industry based standard. And in this range, you optimize salt levels, providing a strong rise and a resilient product through proofing and baking. When it's under 1.25%, the dough flows out very square in the pan and rises quickly, showing much more fragile structure and often sticky and more flat during the rising process. Gentle handling, the product may make it through proofing without collapse. However, these doughs are notorious for collapse during baking. If you look online, you don't really see a lot of photos of finished salt-free breads. Yes, there are some like these I quickly grabbed of what I consider to be nice looking products. And then you got the rest of the stuff. Often short in volume, maybe pale, maybe collapsed a bit, 
and nevertheless all edible and seemingly more of the norm for what folks can expect when trying these at home. If no salt or low salt is what you want, there are some changes that need to be made to both the recipe and the process. Salt directly affects the dough in many ways, so it just makes sense that if it's not there, something should be changed. Salt is a ubiquitous ingredient in nearly all processed foods found at your grocery store. When baking bread, it's important to consider the salt content of any additional ingredients you might be using. It can add up very quickly through the addition of enrichment or flavor additives to the recipe, and yes, it may even be in some flours. When it comes to the four pillars of baking, salt probably is the most important ingredient for ensuring a working recipe. Sorry, but I don't put three or more hours of baking time in to set myself up for failure. If I had any concerns or issues about my flour, it'd be 2% salt. If my environmental conditions were warm, 2% salt. If it was a high hydration dough, automatically 2% salt. If the recipe called for fillings or toppings I want, 2% salt. If I had a bulk fermentation plan of an extended, for an extended period of time, like overnight or multi-day, I want 2% salt. All of these are just a few examples of why bakers would opt for the industry total salt standard of 2% when making a new recipe, regardless of the recipe author's recommendation. This choice can make the difference between success and your disaster. Now, as I mentioned, salt is the master control in yeast-raised doughs. Water may need to be adjusted based on your flour and desired characteristics. Yeast may be adjusted to get your rest and fermentation and final proof times where you want them. But salt is the building block from which all of the adjustments are directly tied to. You know, most people don't think about salt too much when it's baking. It's just one of those little ingredients that go into dough, right? Wrong. Salt plays a crucial role in achieving the perfect balance in your recipes. Salt is more than just a seasoning, it's a cornerstone of precision baking, guiding everything from yeast activity through dough hydration to fermentation timing and oven spring. Without properly planning for the salt that you want in your dough, based on your flour and your environment, your dough may lack the structure, texture, and flavor needed for a successful bake. This is a common theme for new bakers trying new recipes they found online. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't because the standards are missing incomplete, or the recipe's not properly balanced from the start. Where some sites like to give you options for turning a disaster into something maybe you can eat at the end of the day, I like to focus on eliminating fails, period. Understanding the importance of salt is essential for consistent results, and that's why the salt expansion in the baking assistant is designed to be comprehensive. Baking isn't just an art, it's a science that requires careful attention to every detail. By mastering the role of salt and its critical and direct interaction with other ingredients, you unlock the potential to bake every product to perfection every single time.